Okay, welcome, welcome everyone to another edition of Chosky Chats. Each chat, of course, we host a guest who's accomplished something truly exceptional in the world of endurance athletics and bring you a live conversation curated by our incredible staff here at Chosky and featuring questions submitted by you, our amazing audience of fans. I'm your host, Tyler Andrews. This week, we are going to be joined by Elise Cranny. Elise is a member of the Nike-sponsored Bowerman Track Club, where she's seen tremendous success under coach Jerry Schumacher, including winning U.S. Olympic Trials 5,000 meter last summer, earning her a spot on the U.S. Olympic team for Tokyo for the Tokyo Games, where she finished 13th. Since then, her 2022 has stunned many running fans as she broke the U.S. Indoor 5,000 meter record, running 14.33, Pretty speedy, guys. You better watch out. And then follow that up with a 3014 10,000 meter run at the Sound Running 10 on March 6th, just one second off the American record. And I see her popping in now, so we're going to let her in and then we will talk all things training much more. And we are just waiting for that connection. And there we are. Hey, Elise, how are Hello. you? Hello, I'm good. How are you doing? Great. It's great to uh, great to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us. This is going to be awesome. Of course. I'm excited. So thanks for having me. Um, no, it's a funny coincidence because last night I, w- I was talking to Marielle, actually. She was doing another talk for us, um, kind of our, our uh, we call it Women Talk Wellness. It's a master class series that we do where we highlight female athletes. So two of... Uh, two of my highest profile <laughs> Bowerman connections here. So I'm very excited. It's going to be awesome. Oh, I love it. I love that you were talking to her. Yeah. Miss having her in Portland. Yeah, I know. Um, anyway, so let's get to it. Uh, for those of you listening, uh, Elise needs no further introduction. I think um, I'd love to talk through a little bit about really like the last kind of eight months, um, like since the Olympic trials leading into your, your recent run at the 10. And then we have some listener, listener questions at the end uh, that we kind of hand text. Some of those are really fun. Um, but I'd love to start um, looking at kind of your race results. It looks like you, you ran the Olympics, um, finished 13th in the 5K, and then um, you raced some Diamond League races. And then we didn't really see you from – I think like September until that BU race uh, in February. So can you kind of walk us through the the post Olympics, like what that was like for you guys? I know you trained super hard. So I'm curious if you have a, a set rest period, what that looks like. And then I'm also curious to hear a little bit about if you have any of that kind of post Olympics blues fatigue that we hear about from some runners. Yeah. Yeah. So usually at the end of the season, we'll get um, a little bit of time where we're just running. We take like, you know, usually a month kind of off workouts. Um, so I went home to Colorado, which was really nice. I think it's like a really good reset. And it's nice to be in a place where you can kind of like, I can run on my favorite trails and just like, I don't nice. know, go off like, you know, effort and just enjoying being out there and kind of not focus on any of like the times or the splits that you're, you know, really focused on a lot um, of the other parts of the year. So um, that, I think that was a really huge, uh, reset for me. I came back, yeah, from racing some diamond leagues over in Europe and, um, was there for about a month. Um, and my friend from home got married. So it was like a kind of nice to focus on, on some other things when you're, you know, at altitude and then racing kind of so, so laser focused on, on running. So that was, that was a good reset for sure. And then, yeah, after that, we kind of just got back into like, the fall base building phase. Um, and that's what we were doing for, for several months. And I think, um, in terms of coming off the Olympics, I think, I think part of me felt like it was just such a big, like growth and learning experience that I was actually pretty excited to kind of get back to training just because I felt like I had learned a lot of like tangible things and, um, you know, racing for the first time on the global stage was really excited to, um, just like hungry for more. So I think that was kind of helpful in um, returning to training after that, just in terms of like, okay, I want to get um, back to work and I'm excited now that I feel like my eyes have kind of been open to, to this whole new stage of running. Awesome. So when you have that period where you're in Colorado, do you have literal mandated rest, like no running at all or just cross training or are you kind of allowed to do whatever you want in that period? Yeah, usually um, it's kind of up to you. It's pretty like individualized, but um, I've always like 
you know, since high school responded well to like taking some complete time off and just letting the body like completely reset. Mm -hmm. So um, I took uh, like two weeks completely off and then kind of just slowly building back my mileage from there. Um, And I think that was actually like really, really helpful in terms of, yeah, like, you know, when it was time to build back up and do that fall training, like I think that really kind of allowed everything from like the racing and the training of the summer to set in and allow just like any, you know, little niggles or injuries to, you know, kind of go away and focus on that. Um, and again, I think even the mental break is just so important of like taking a step oh, yeah. fully away from running. <laughs> yeah. And it's nice when you have something like fun and social, like a wedding that actually lines up with your off season versus like being in the middle of your peak or something. <laughs> It's so much better. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's great to have any sort of, yeah, like event or thing like that when you're in the off season. Because like I said, you can kind of fully, you know, disconnect from the running for a bit. And then I think be fully present at those events. Because yeah, you're not like in the peak season, like trying to be really focused on what you're doing. Totally. Okay, so cool. So then you have rest period, a base phase. And then at some point, you clearly start training hard because you're super fit, <laughs> like right now. So uh at, you go to BU which I went to school in Boston and grew up in that area so like I know how fast that track is and everything so tell us like was that kind of the the long-term goal looking at that that particular meet on that track with like a bunch of you on the team how, how did that kind of come about and what were your goals going into that race yeah um so it wasn't set in stone I think you know Jerry was still kind of trying to decide on the timing of everything just like when USA's fell at first, it was like, maybe we'll do the BU last chance me, but then it was the same weekend as USA's. So um, mm-hmm. he ended up thinking like, okay, this was a good time to run there. And like you said, the track is so fast. It's always like a really good environment, um, great place to run. And so he started kind of talking about that. We went up to Flagstaff for altitude at the beginning of January and we're there for January and February. So he kind of started talking about it when we went up to altitude camp and he was like, I think, you know, we should try to go after that American record as a team. Um, So yeah, me, Mm -hmm. Gabriella and Courtney were in it. And he was like, I think, you know, we're in shape to, to get, take the record from Shalane. So, so that's kind (laughs) of the focus. That's awesome. So, like, it's funny because like it was Shalane's record, and you were in that race, and Gabrielle Debus Stafford was also in that race, and so she, she, I think, outkicked you basically, right? And so, yeah. is there is there like rivalry amongst you guys on the team? Like, like how does that feel when it's like, oh, it's Shalane's record, and then you and Gabrielle are like kicking it out for you know first place <laughs> honors? Obviously, she's Canadian, you're American, so you still got the American record. But, but like, what is that dynamic like? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's just it was really supportive coming from Shalane, you know, she was like, I want you guys to, to get the record. So I think, and that's something that I feel like she's encouraged for the last couple of years, like, um, Vanessa was like less than a second off, you know, two years ago. So she was like, I think for Vanessa to come so close, Shalane was like, you guys got to get it like someone <laughs> new on the team has to get it. <laughs> um, and then yeah, I would say it's like, I mean, it's really just special to you know, have teammates in the race and be able to work together. It's like, you know, Gabriella and I had been doing a lot of workouts together. So it's like great when you get in that race situation and can work together as well. And like with her, you know, 1500 wheels, uh, <laughs> she, she was able to outkick me, but it was like, you know, the two of us, I feel like working together, like make the race what it was. Like, I don't think either of us run, you know, that fast without the other. So I think that's something that's really special for sure. Yeah. So it's like, I always wonder this when I look at, you know, either the, the big groups in Kenya that are training for the marathon or, or your group where you have so many people running at, at a world-class level, especially like in the same events. So like, do you ever feel like there's a piece of, of like actual competitive pressure between you guys? Like, especially when you're literally in the same races or like you're lining up to try and make the same teams or I guess, how do you balance that sense of kind of camaraderie where, yeah, you're pushing each other in workouts, you're pushing each other in races where, obviously you guys are all super competitive and like you want to win and you want to set records and you want to make teams. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think what's great is like on a daily basis, I don't feel like it feels super competitive, which I think is huge. Like I think, um, you know, that's where it's good to have like everyone kind of, you know, has different strengths and weaknesses, you know? So like, I mean, for example, like, you know, in the, with Gabriella, it was like, she has been like pushing me in some of those like 1500 speed sessions. And then like, on the longer aerobic stuff, like 
I can help her. And so I think, you know, when you're on a team that's some like focusing on that, I think can be really special of just like, okay, what, you know, is everyone's kind of strong suit and when can they help, you know, pull me through a workout that's maybe not as much my strong suit, but it's like, you know, there's definitely the reality, especially when it comes to making teams. Like I think, you know, especially last year we had like our team was just huge and there's just, yeah, the like, (laughs) the reality is like, I mean, all of, I feel like we had talked about is like, even if like our team like swept all the events we were in, like we still wouldn't be able to like get everyone on the team, you know, we were like, we (laughs) we need to start, we need people to like pick up. Spread people out a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) We're becoming too (laughs) concentrated in like the 5k, for example. Um, So it's like, that's part of it too. And I think, you know, that can be hard, like sometimes for sure with the comparison piece as well, just because it's like, you know, some of the people that you're going to be like competing against are your teammates and you're seeing what they're doing day in and day out, which is like, it's like, yeah, that double-edged sword where it's like, you know, you can be like really pushed by them, but it's also like, you know, if you like aren't doing part of the workout, it's really hard to like, you know, still like focus on yourself and, and the confidence that you have when it's like so in your face, you know, I feel like that's already something that's pretty hard with running in general, but let alone when it's like, yeah, you're like, you know, doing the workouts together and you're, and you're really in it. So, but I think, yeah. we, you know, it's like, yeah, we, we push each other. And I think um, it's, yeah, it's, that's a hard part of it when it's like the team's so big and it becomes saturated in one event for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Then you have three weeks between that BU uh, 5k and, and the 10, the 10k. Um, I guess the first question is, did you know at that point that you were going to do that 10k? Cause it sounds like from talking to you and listening to other interviews with people on the team, Jerry can be kind of last minute about when he tells you guys, like what, what was that like for you in terms of how far out did you have that mapped out? And, and I guess just a general question is like, do you like that it's kind of up in the air all the time or, or do you find that frustrating when it's like, I don't know what I'm going to race. I want to race more. Or maybe I want to race less, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit of, it's like, I think sometimes you're, I mean, the first thing I would say is like, I thought maybe I was going to run USA's after boss. And so then when, you mm-hmm. know, people are asking you and you're like, Oh my gosh, like I really want to go to USA's. And then you're like, but I'm, I'm not really sure. I can't give you a concrete answer because <laughs> Jerry's still up in the air. Um, And so I think that part, sometimes you're like, oh, I just want to know, like, you know, what we're doing. But I think um, trusting him and knowing that, you know, he's like, takes longer to make those decisions. And sometimes they're last minute, because he's really trying to figure out, you know, what's best for each individual athlete. And I think when you feel like your coach is really invested, I think that, you know, is really powerful. Um, So we were kind of going back and forth, because I was definitely, you know, really interested in running USAs, I think just, um, you know, seeing... Uh, Milrose and like the New Balance meet just um, a lot of like American middle distance runners like running super well in the 15 and 3k and I was like USA is going to be like really good competition I think it would be Mm -hmm. I I mean I love running indoor I love running on the bank track so I was you know excited for possibly the opportunity to do that Um, so we kind of went back and forth um, and just with the timing of them being a week apart was like okay it's not going to be possible to do to do both so then I would say maybe like a week or so or a couple of days after like the 5k we decided okay I think you know we're gonna commit to doing the 10 so um yeah I think then once we had decided it it's helpful to just even in focusing on like training and then getting excited for the race because you know okay this is you know the goal this is this is what we're doing yeah so then okay so, so to be honest, so I ran in college, I was D3 runner, and my PRs in college are very similar to your 5K and 10K PRs now. So I'm very curious to hear if you're willing to share, like, what what were the workouts in that period that really made you confident? Like, okay, I want to go for this American record, the 3013 mark. Um, were there any specific sessions that you could share with us that were like, okay, I'm totally ready for that? Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think... Um... I think it's honestly like even more so just like the feeling of like, I was just started to do a good amount of um, workouts that were like kind of at that 72, 73 second pace. And just, I think the feeling Mm -hmm. that, I mean, it never feels, you know, like you're running fast. So it never feels easy running that pace, but I think just feeling like I was getting in a rhythm running 72s. um, Like, I think that was something that, 
you know, gave me a good amount of, of confidence going, going into it. So even if it's just, um, you know, some miles or things that are like, you know, you're doing a good amount of volume at, at that pace and maybe, yeah, the longest rep is a mile, but knowing like, okay, if I'm doing, you know, six to seven miles and I'm doing, um, most of it like close to that 72, 73 second pace. I think those are the workouts that give me a lot of confidence of knowing like, okay, you can do it for, you know, close to the distance, not consecutively, obviously of the 10 K and sure. you can like do, do it at, you know, kind of goal pace. Um, and I think like the feeling of it, a feeling like you're in a rhythm is like, okay, now I feel like I can go into the 10 K and kind of make it feel like that rhythmic running. Yeah. Gotcha. And I mean, you were a, a metronome out there for a while. We were watching the, the live broadcast here. And for those of you who didn't see it, uh, you ran the last 7,000 meters by yourself. That's 70% of the race. So I guess, did you know that that was going to happen in the race? Did you think maybe you'd have a pacer for longer or company? I know that Grant mentioned in some interviews, like the pacers were super last minute on the men's side. So I'm curious to know if that was something you knew ahead of time. Hey, this is going to be like a real solo grind or if that was kind of a, a surprise at that point, we just found yourself there at 3K. Yeah, Jerry had kind of prepared me for at least like the second half being solo. Um, but I think it was the same thing on the women's side. It's just, it's really hard to find a pacer because it's like yeah. anyone who wants to run a 10K, like anyone who would want to pace, like wants to be in that race, you know? And I think especially right. like with, you know, USA's being earlier, it was like, this feels like one of the main like 10 Ks that people were targeting. So I feel like, you know, people want to race like understandably. So, um, and so I think, um, Taylor Warner and then my teammate, Lucia, um, they paced, um, through two K and three K, which was super helpful. And we weren't really sure. Jerry was like, I'm not really sure like how long they're going to go, like maybe to four K, maybe to five K. So it was kind of, up in the air, but I think he had prepared me for like, at some point it's going to be like a pretty long solo effort. And so I think yeah. that like, I'm glad that he told me that and prepared me for that. Um, Cause I think it allowed me to yeah get in that rhythmic running at, at three K instead of like panicking. Yeah. I'm like, okay, you have, you know, seven K to go. <laughs> Did you, did you do anything specific in prep for that? Like, were you doing any workouts where it's like, okay, I'm just going to go out and crank out some 72s by myself or like, obviously you guys have lots of people to train with every day. So was that something that you were able to prepare for? Yeah, I actually do feel like, um, in training like this year, I think I've been really focused on, um, like leading a bit more and trying to be more comfortable in the front, just cause I, that's not something that I've like been comfortable with in the past and like have, like definitely struggled in the past with getting in a good rhythm. Like I tend to like go out way too hard the first two hunt and just like very uneven pacing. And I'm like, you, <laughs> you definitely don't want to be doing that, you know, for the, no. <laughs> the last 16 laps of the 10 K at least like you're going to make that much harder for yourself. So I think um, really trying to focus on, I mean, even all fall, you know, even when we're doing, we were doing workouts this fall, you know, like longer tempos or things that like aren't at race pace, but like focusing on like, you know, trying to be as even as possible and, and working on that pacing and yeah, getting comfortable, um, like leading from the front is, is something that I've been working on the last couple months. Gotcha. And of course you did have the, the wave lights, which are a very cool addition to the track. Uh, did you find those helpful or I know that there's some confusion at the end, but I'm I, like for those, first uh whatever like five six k where you were kind of like right on it or ahead of it was that something that was helpful for you in terms of pacing it by yourself yeah it was super helpful I think I mean especially for like the pacers as well it's just like it's nice kind of to be able to relax when you have the pacers in front of you and like okay they're right on the lights like there's nothing you need to think about um you don't need to think about hearing those splits um and then it was like really helpful you know like you said even at the end of like just having like something to chase like it felt like you know you're neck yeah. and neck with someone like running down that home stretch like <laughs> trying to catch them and so I think yeah I think it's just like a really cool technology and something that um it, it, I mean I feel like it just added to the whole the whole atmosphere of the night yeah so then spoiler alert you read 3014 the American records 3013 um What's your immediate reaction crossing the line? I'm sure this is a question I'm getting from everybody, but I'm curious to hear like 
was there a moment of like, ah, God damn it. At, like right there. <laughs> and then has that changed in the last like week and a half since that race? Yeah, I think so. I think my initial thought was like confusion. Cause I had forgot that the lights <laughs> were set to 30, 16 and Shalane and our PT Colleen were like at the finish and they were like, Ooh, Oh my God. Like they were like, you know, they were like, you got it. And I was like, I was sure that I hadn't cause I, wa I knew that it was 30, 13 and I watched the clock change from 13 to 14 mm -hmm. as I was crossing. So I was like, unless, like, unless that clock was off, like the I, clock I is wrong, yeah. <laughs> and so I was like kind of confused at first. And then, yeah, I think the initial thought after that was like, Oh my gosh, like just like being so close, you know? Um, mm -hmm. and so I think, yeah. And then I think like a, a little bit after, I think you even kind of like replay the race a lot in your head. Like I was just like, oh my gosh, like over 25 laps, like one and a half seconds is like, <laughs> feels like nothing, you know, <laughs> and it's yeah. like, you kind of drive yourself crazy. Like my second to last lap was a lot slower. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel like I could have run, you know, just two seconds faster there. Or then you like divide it up over 25 laps and you're like, wow, I could have just run like you know, less than point <laughs> one, one second step, faster. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that was kind of my, my initial like thoughts or kind of like frustration on that. But then I think, you know, the more I thought about it of just like, wow, like, you know, if you would have told me like a year ago when I first like did the 10 K that, you know, this is what I would be running. And I think, um, I think what I've tried to focus on is just like the way that I was able to run it. Like, like I said, like I have kind of, I think struggled in the past to like lead or, you know, get into that rhythm running. So I think like the more that I looked back and thought on the race, I was like, I'm really proud of the way that I was able to run it. Like not knowing how far the pacers were going to go, like staying really like calm and relaxed early on um, and being able to, you know, push from the front. And then I think, you know, rally the last lap too, when I feel like I, the last mile I was kind of hitting a big wall. So I think, when I started to look at it more like that, I think there were a lot of takeaways of in terms of like how I, you know, mentally was in the race and how I was able to say like, okay, let's try to make, you know, these 72 points feel as rhythmic as possible, even when you're getting super tired. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing I wanted to touch on with this race is, so Nike has obviously been a pioneer in kind of the super shoe movement. Um, so I'm curious to hear your take on, I assume you were wearing the Dragonfly spikes, the kind of newest version of the spike, and I've actually never worn them, but I'm curious, w what was your recovery like after that? And do you notice a big difference? Like the last track 10K I ran, I think I wore like Matumbos or something in college and <laughs> just like could barely walk my calves or bricks the next like week. So what I've heard is, is not only do they allow you to race harder they're a little bit more efficient but the recovery is way better when you work out or race and spike so what's your experience been like yeah I mean I think they're great in terms of like you know coming off workouts and stuff and being more protective of like the feet and calves um I guess I don't really know because like that was you know, the fastest 10 K I've run and it was really hard. So I was like pretty, pretty wrecked the next day, but it's like, you know, I'm sure it was, I'm sure it was better with the shoes, but I would definitely say my, my calves and my body were still, were still pretty wrecked, but I'm sure it was better than it would have been. Yeah. Running when there was, you know, not as much foam and kind of like cushion yeah. to help, to help protect. And so are you, are you actually doing workouts in spikes like pretty regularly? Because again, like, whatever I'm dating myself, but like 10 years ago, it was like a big deal to work out in spikes. And now it seems like track runners are doing way more work in spikes because the recovery is so much better. Yeah. I definitely think you can do more in spikes. And I think I still try to save the spikes for like the, like, you know, kind of more all out speed sessions or those bigger kind of like race specific sessions. Um, mm -hmm. Just cause I kind of like to wear flats. And again, like I have a tendency to get like pretty tight calves and things like that. So I like to protect them, mm -hmm. but I definitely think, um, yeah, you're able to use them more because you're able to come back like two days later and do another workout instead of them being yeah, correct. That's for wild. <laughs> <laughs> totally days. wild. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well, I, I have a few listener questions I want to go through and then we'll kind of wrap up looking ahead a little bit. Um, one thing that I'm super curious, this is actually a great question. And, and so I'm actually at altitude now. We have a lot of people at altitude on our team. And apparently it's the word on the street is that Jerry coach Schumacher doesn't really adjust workout paces when you guys go to altitude. So I'm curious, like how that works mechanically. Are you still like hitting race pace, but you're doing 
like more rest, like stuff is broken up because like as someone who's trained a lot at altitude, I, I'm always kind of figuring like trying to finagle workouts. So it's like, I can still hit race pace, but sometimes it's like just literally impossible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Usually it will be, um, I mean, this is also like once we've been there for a couple of weeks, like he doesn't, you know, throw us in the deep end, like two days after we get there. <laughs> it's like, he likes to be <laughs> like, good. okay, you know, wait until, you know, you've had, you know, like a good, um, response to the altitude after a couple of weeks and you're starting to adapt. Um, and so, um, and then usually I would say, especially like for the race specific sessions, like having, um, a little bit more rest. So it's like, you're not yeah. like getting in that deep hole, but I mean, it's definitely like, especially last year, like I had a lot of workouts where you kind of like you feel good in the rev I'm sure as everyone has ex anyone who's gone out to does experience or you get excited a little bit too early and then you definitely like pay for it the Cross second that line. <laughs> like you're like yep I like, am hitting a wall and there's you know there's no coming back from it so I think you know that's definitely like the added piece it's that's hard with, with altitude too. It's just, I don't know. That's like, I, I don't know. I found that most challenging. It's kind of like managing your effort of like, maybe you feel good, but like don't put yourself in a hole at, at altitude too early. Cause you have less kind of wiggle room there. Um, but yeah, he, I would say like, yeah, more rest or, or breaking up some of the, you know, if we're having shorter rest, maybe breaking it up a little bit into some smaller sets. So you're not, you know, getting so in the hole that you like, you can't yep. do the rest of the workout. Yeah, no, I've, I've found that same thing. It's like that the line at altitude is like, if you cross the line, it's so hard to get back. It's <laughs> like, if you're at sea level, you can kind of just dial it back for a few seconds and catch your breath at altitude. It's like, if you go over that line, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> it's so, and then it's like, I feel like no amount of rest could help you. Like at that point, like it doesn't matter if you're taking like two or three minutes or like eight minutes. I feel like once you've gone over it, it's just, you're toasted. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So we had a bunch of questions about kind of basically non running stuff. So things like uh, recovery modalities, whether that's like work in the gym, um, you know, PT, massage work, things like that. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about just essentially what you and your teammates are doing outside of the little literal running that you do. Um, both for injury prevention and things like strength and just general health? Yeah. So we have, the first thing is we have a PT that started working with our team last year, which has been huge. Um, she has been great. Um, we get like, we'll see her once or twice a week um, and she'll come to workouts and stuff, which is really nice. So she can kind of look at, you know, form, look at how we're moving. Um, and she's been really helpful in giving like, you know, rehab exercises or even preventative exercises. Um, like over the last two years, um, I've been able to do like a couple people on the team, we've been able to do kind of like a motion analysis test too, where you're, you know, running and um, at different paces. So she can like really target kind of some specific strength. And that's been really helpful. So that kind of goes into like, you know, the lifting is, is really an important part of our routine and, you know, doing, you know, the smaller like foot exercises or strengthening the calf, the soleus, things like that. Um, so we usually, everyone's a little bit different on the team, but for me, like I like to do, um, I usually do kind of specific leg strength on hard workout days. So twice a week and then um, do kind of just more like, core mobility stuff like another two to three times a week but I like to kind of package it on the on the hard workout days of doing that you know really specific kind yeah. of targeted leg strength um and then um everyone on the team's kind of different with like what else they like I like my body responds really well to massage so I try to um, get one once a week in addition to to the PT because um, I find that super helpful and just um, keeping everything you know loose and I think that's what I've learned um, you know the last couple of years since being a pro is like that the like, recovery is honestly you know the most important piece of like being able to not just how you feel in the workout but like how do you feel coming off the workout in a couple of days later so that you can kind of keep stringing you know workouts and runs together over time. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the that's when I look at like the professional side of running versus the amateur side of running, I think that's the biggest thing is like the focus on not only are you out there hammering workouts, but it's about what you do for recovery in, in the like hours and then days after that. Um, and so that actually leads into another question really well, which is 
what aspects of elite level training do you think would be most useful or applicable to like a club level amateur or like a high school or college runner? Yeah, I honestly feel like you just said recovery. Like, I think that's something that um, I honestly didn't even realize when I was in college. Like, it's almost that thing where you don't really realize, like, for lack of a better word, like, I didn't realize how kind of bad my body felt when I was like, (laughs) not really taking care of it, like, not really sleeping, like biking around to class, you know, and I wish that I would have, I would say the biggest thing would be like consistent sleep, like, out of anything like I think that's what's made the biggest difference I think in my recovery is just getting like trying to go to bed at a consistent time and getting you know consistently like you know eight to ten hours of sleep which I was like not getting in in college and I think you know that over anything else is like I don't know for me I think is most important in the recovery so I would say yeah I would say that <laughs> are, you, are you a nap person too do you get a nap in or are you just eight to ten at night yeah, I also I also nap, especially when we go when we go up to altitude. Um, so that's nice. been really helpful too. And it's like that's where you know I notice a difference too of like before I go to do like if I'm doing strength that afternoon after a workout or a double, it's like I notice that the days that I take even just like a 20 minute nap, I feel so much better and more excited to like do the you know second session of the day, which I think makes a really big difference too. Yeah, no, that that's, that's a great answer. It's, it's often the same answer I get. It's like, yeah, just try and get more sleep, try and even if it's a 20 minute power nap, like yeah. that, it makes such a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of a specific question, but so Grant, uh, Grant Fisher in an interview, um, I think it was with Batsaran mentioned that there's like a really steep learning curve with the Bowerman group for a lot of people that uh, coach Schumacher kind of just expects people to hop in that no one's really babied when they first get there and i mean both you and grant are examples of you guys were already really good in college and now you get thrown into this professional group and he talked about just those that first year or so there being like a really rough adjustment phase where he just felt like he was trashed all the time so i'm curious to hear what your initial you know year or two was like with that group did you find that as well that even going from you know a top level college program like stanford to btc there was a a really big jump in terms of expectation yeah there was a huge jump (laughs) um it's yeah i think especially for me i had um a fifth year in cross country so i joined also at a weird time like i joined in Hmm. march so i didn't even have like the fall base that they had so they were already kind of doing Hmm intense tra- track stuff and I was just like oh, oh my gosh. god and there was like there was kind of like a good like two weeks maybe where I think I was still like semi-fresh like I wasn't tired because I was coming in and I was really excited and then I hit this point where it's like I was tired and like not in really great shape like this in-between phase where you're just like oh my gosh like I'm not, like finishing half the workout and like I vividly remember one it was just like we had 20 by 200 and I literally like I think I maybe like willed myself to make it to 12 and was just like, I just stopped. I just could not go. And Jerry was like, what's going on? And I was like, I, I just can't move my legs anymore. Like I, this is, I'm at my max. I can't. And so there were a lot of workouts like that. Um, the first year. And I think, um, you know, even like when we were talking about the recovery piece is like, even just how I felt on easy runs the next day, like I knew that, like each workout was such a steep learning curve, because I'd like, you know, go start to do an easy run the next day. And I would just be so tired, like, you know, like barely breaking an eight minute pace and like, like Mm -hmm. feeling just like absolutely exhausted. And um, I think like, you know, and then it's like, it slowly gets better. And maybe you're, you know, finishing a little bit more of the workout. And then it's like, you know, he is like throwing me into um, like with Shelby and Carissa to do race workout, like race specific workouts last year. And it's like, um, or two years, I guess in 2020. And now I'm like, maybe I'm finishing three quarters, but I'm just getting like, absolutely just like dropped. Like, again, to the point where like, you know, we talk about hitting the wall, like you're doing okay. And then you're just like, I, you know, I can't go anymore. I've, I've hit a max. And so um, I think you slowly, you know, see over time, though, like, that's what I've the big I think the biggest thing that I've noticed, like this year, um, 
is just like, again, how I come off the workouts and like, I'm better able, like I was able to increase my mileage a little bit and felt like that was manageable for, you know, kind of the first time. Cause I felt like before it was just like, you're trying to, you know, get through the intensity of the workouts or maybe you're not even finishing the workout. So you can't, you know, really even focus on kind of increasing that mileage. But I think that's, what's really cool when you start to, you know, see yourself gain the strength to better figure out the workouts. And then you're like, okay, I can kind of tweak these pieces here. I can, add a little mileage here now because like I'm yeah I'm not like <laughs> slogging through every run because I'm so tired <laughs> from the workout and trying to recover for the next workout <laughs> yeah so that and the other interesting thing that I that actually really surprised me from uh listening to Grant talk was he said that Jerry actually kind of lets you guys figure out your own mileage um which I, that again just based on like how much I see um him controlling like the race schedule and everything that was really surprising. So I'm, um, how has your mileage progressed from like college to, you know, the first year or two as a pro when you were like, then you ran 1448 and then even this last build up. Yeah, it is funny. Actually, I hadn't thought about that. He is like so meticulous and so detailed yeah. <laughs> about everything. Like, it's fun. I, I don't know why, but I haven't ever thought about that. I'm like, he is pretty hands off when it comes to like exactly outside of the workouts, like how you want to structure your training, which I do think is really cool. Like, I think that is something that I, um, at first was like hard to adjust to just when you feel like you've been, you know, given exactly what you're doing, but I think it's like a good way to figure out and make you stop and think of like what works best for you. Like, do I feel better if I do some longer runs and less doubles or more doubles? Um, so I kept the first year that I was here, I kept it pretty similar to kind of what I'd ended on in college. I was, um, probably like 55 toward the end of college. So I think that first wow. year I did, um, like 60 stayed around 60 miles or so, maybe like up to 65, but, um, wasn't, yeah, again, wasn't too focused on the mileage that first year. Cause I was trying to figure out, figure out the, the workouts. Um, and then 2020 kind of moved up to like trying to make 70 more consistent. Um, and then, um, last year, um, started to get up to 75, like hit, hit 80 a couple times. Um, and then this year I've been kind of more in that like 85, um, to 90 range. Um, and so, yeah, just like a slow, a really slow build over time, which I think was really helpful again, to learn from older people on the team too, is like, you know, you can work on, you know, slowly increasing the mileage incrementally once you've kind of figured out the workouts and you feel like you can handle it. Cause otherwise it's just, you're not getting the benefit if you're just exhausted all the time. So. Oh, totally. No. <laughs> and so is he completely hands off with that? And that like, would he say like, Oh, you know, at least you have a down week because you're racing a 10 K or are you kind of expected to do those kind of macro planning yourself? Yeah. Yeah. He's very hands off with that. I think that's where Shalane hmm. has actually been really, really helpful. Um, usually like a lot of us will reach out to her before a race and we'll be like, Hey, can you help us kind of figure out the taper situation? Um, which is really nice. Cause she'll kind of give us like a structure the last like couple weeks leading up to a big race, which is nice. You just like, don't have to think about it. You don't have to be questioning if you're you know doing enough or doing too much. And so that's mm -hmm. been really nice. Um, and then, yeah, usually like she's also a helpful resource of like, okay, if we're, going up to altitude, do we need to like drop the mileage a bit just because like the like intensity will be higher right. and we'll be at altitude. So she's like a really good sounding board for that. But yeah, Jerry, in terms of like specifics like that is, is pretty hands off. <laughs> Interesting. Awesome. Okay. Um, one last kind of looking ahead question. And I'll let you go. Um, so you are someone who could realistically qualify at USA as probably in a 15, 5k and 10k. So I'm curious, what's your plan for the U.S. championships in, and then Worlds in Eugene? And is there any chance that we will see you attempt the Sifan Hassan triple this summer? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, uh, I don't think I'll be, I'll be attempting the triple. Uh, she, she did that so well. I don't know if it can, it can be attempted. I think we'll leave that, we'll leave that to her. Um, but, no, I think – I mean, I think it's nice that – you know, the 10 K is in May. Um, I think it, it's just, mm -hmm. it will be exciting that, you know, more people can do the 10 K and 5 K. I think it will make for a really good race. Um, so I think, yeah, focusing on the 10 and the five, and then 
we'll see. Maybe I can convince Jerry to let me get in the 15 too, but <laughs> say the 10 and the five will, will probably be my focus going into USA's. Awesome. And do you think we'll see you racing between now and that, uh, that may qualifier at three? I hope so. I want to race a 1500, so I need to get in, get in Jerry's ear and see if that's possible, but I'd love to race <laughs> sometime in April, um, maybe a 1500, but again, that's, that's just my own plan. So I got to, got to check with the boss, man. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, that's all I've got. Um, anything else you want to, uh, wrap up with here? I don't think so. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for, okay. thank you for having me. This has been great. No, it's, it's super, super fun. It's great to, to chat. And, um, yeah, we will be wishing you the best of luck, hopefully at a 15 in April. And if not at the, uh, the 10 K trials in May and then the, the 5 K trials, uh, in Eugene. Thank you. Enjoy awesome. your guys' altitude training camp over there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> we will. All right. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.